Lecture number nine, the social dimension of the Buddha's teaching. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. In the past, Buddhism has often been subject to a common misunderstanding and misrepresentation. It has been viewed as an exclusively otherworldly religion, a doctrine directed solely to a transcendental goal without any concern for this world other than its abandonment. It is held by some writers that the only authentic way to follow the teaching of the Buddha is to renounce the world, to become a monk, and retire to a forest or cave in order to practice meditation. In the view of these writers, the Buddha does not offer any teaching that is of relevance to man in the world, to people faced with the problems of day-to-day life, that he holds out no principles for resolving the tangles and difficulties of social, economic, and political life. Theravada Buddhism, in particular, has been depicted in this distorted way as a teaching of an exclusively otherworldly nature, as an austere monastic code which encourages each individual's private pursuit of his own salvation, and which does not even give a fleeting glance to the larger questions facing society. Now, all of these charges, as we said, involve serious misunderstandings and misrepresentation. At the outset, we have to stress that the ultimate aim of the Buddha's teaching is the transcending of the world. On this point, there can be no hedging, compromise, or any need for apologetics. The ultimate aim, the highest aim of the Dhamma is liberation from the round of birth and death, deliverance from samsara, because all life in samsara, in the world of becoming, is incomplete and unsatisfactory. It is all impermanent. It all involves suffering. It is without any substantial basis. But though the Buddha teaches that the transcendence of the world is the ultimate goal, he treats this goal in perspective, in relation to the totality of human life. For every aspect of human life is connected in some way to the other aspects. No aspect can be treated in isolation from the whole. Life in the world is not opposed to or unrelated to our spiritual quest, but it can become part of the path which leads to the achievement of deliverance. The Dhamma has two aspects, two dimensions, a dimension of depth and a dimension of breath. In its dimension of depth, the Dhamma leads to the overcoming of the world. But in its dimension of breath, of wideness, of extensiveness, it embraces all facets of human existence. And it shows how all these different sides of human life can become transformed, elevated, and ennobled, absorbed into the comprehensive path leading to liberation. We see both of these aspects illustrated in the life of the Buddha himself. Prior to his own quest for enlightenment, The future Buddha renounced the household life, the palace, and he went forth into homelessness to become a wanderer, a seeker of wisdom in the forest. 
And this move on his part teaches an important lesson. It teaches that renunciation and detachment from the concerns of the world at a certain point becomes an essential element of the path aimed at deliverance. And since the Buddha was a family man with wife and child and a prince who is destined to lead the country, this act of renunciation on his part teaches an important lesson. It teaches us that the quest for enlightenment has priority over all mundane social and political claims. That it is the paramount duty of man to seek his wisdom and freedom, and nothing can obstruct him from achieving the same. However, the life of the Buddha teaches us more. For after he reached his enlightenment, the Buddha did not keep his teaching to himself. He did not remain silent and withdrawn in the forest. But he came back into the world to teach and proclaim his doctrine to all people, to show all the way to release from suffering, to show all them the way to happiness. And in the course of his teaching mission, the Buddha associated with people from all walks of life. In his own words, he said, Very often I dwell surrounded by monks and nuns, by laymen and laywomen. I live surrounded by kings and princes, by businessmen and merchants, brahmins and recluses. He claimed that he lived and worked for the welfare of the entire world. To show the relevance of his mission, the Buddha says of himself in one sutta, in the Anguttara Nikaya, he says that if one could say of any one single person that he is born in the world and lives for the welfare of the many folk, for the happiness of the many folk, out of compassion for the world, for the good of all the world, it is of him, the Buddha, rightly speaking, that one could say this. And of course, since the Buddha is free from all pride and conceit, the statement has to be taken as completely objective, not a boastful utterance on his part. Then, to show the relevance of his teaching to people from all walks of life, the Buddha says, If my teaching could only be practiced by monks and nuns, but couldn't be practiced by laymen and laywomen, then my teaching would be defective in these two respects. It would be an imperfect doctrine for the reason that it couldn't be practiced by laymen and laywomen. But then he adds, because my doctrine can be practiced by all, by monks, by nuns, by lay by laymen, by lay women, therefore it is a completely perfect and pure doctrine. Now the teaching of the Buddha is said to lead to three types of benefits. That is, it leads to benefit in this present life, to benefit in future lives and it leads to the ultimate benefit, the ultimate good of human existence. The first or most elementary benefit of the Dhamma is called the present life benefit or welfare and happiness here and now in Pali, Dita Dhamma Sukhahita. This is the good, the welfare of men and women living in the world. The Dhamma is intended to promote this good, to promote economic, political, and social justice, to promote personal well-being, happiness, and peace of mind right here and now, to conduce 
to friendly and harmonious relations between people. Then at the second level, as the second good, the Dhamma conduces to future benefit, that is, to our benefit in future lives, because it shows us the way we can cultivate our karma, our actions of body, speech, and mind, so that as long as we are going to remain in samsara, we will be able to advance through our future lives, taking favorable forms of rebirth, forms that will aid us in our quest for final liberation. This benefit is called Samparaika Sukhahita, that is the good, the happiness, and welfare pertaining to the future. The third and highest benefit of the Dhamma This is called the Paramatta Sukhahita. That is the achievement of ultimate welfare and happiness, the attainment of Nibbana or final deliverance. Now to give a fully adequate account of the Buddha's teaching, these three aspects or benefits have to be included brought together. Emphasis upon one to the exclusion of the others will lead to a distorted representation, and that is just what has happened with most scholars who have focused only upon the third, the final benefit of the Buddha's teaching, the achievement of nirvana, and have tended to neglect the other two aspects, the welfare and happiness here and now, and the benefits in future lives though these are also essential to the total structure of the teaching, and these further form the basis for the attainment of the ultimate aim. The Buddha gives teachings and doctrines that lead to our benefit here and now, to material and social well-being. But all the good and benefits that come from the Buddha's teaching are set out in a graded order, so that the benefit here and now, material and social well-being, is not the end or final goal of the teaching. The final and highest end of the teaching is the spiritual goal, the attainment of nirvana. From the Buddha's perspective, if we just seek material or economic welfare, then human life, becomes degraded to the level of animal life. We become concerned only with eating, sleeping, reproducing, gaining pleasure, with living in comfort and convenience. And to live in such a way insults the potential value of human life. The Buddha teaches that the economic and social stability that come even from the application of his teaching have to serve as the basis or foundation for our higher development, for our development in the moral, spiritual, and intellectual spheres. And when we make the attainment of deliverance our goal, and seek the application of that aspiration to the rest of our life, then the aspiration to the highest goal bends back, so to speak, to change and transform our economic and social life. So that these, instead of being pursued as ends in themselves, come to be recognized as having a secondary value as laying the foundation for inner cultivation. Nevertheless, they are, though of secondary value, they are very important for the practice of the path. Since if we live in a society and culture which denigrates spiritual values, which rejects any claim of human life to moral dignity and worth, then it becomes very difficult, perhaps even impossible, for a person to develop 
along the Noble Eightfold Path. To be able to practice the Dharma properly, what is required is a secure material foundation, a peaceful and beneficent government, a free society which allows opportunities for spiritual exploration and practice. Thus, we see these two aspects to be mutually supporting. Material well-being provides the support for spiritual development, and the pursuit of the spiritual goal determines the form of the social order. Now, in order to further appreciate the social application of the Buddha's doctrine, we have to be aware that there are two basic concerns which the practitioner has to apply to his teach to his practice. That is the concern for his own good and concern for the good of others. Theravada Buddhism sometimes has been portrayed as a self-centered doctrine, a doctrine which instructs us to seek our own well-being without any concern for the well-being of others. But if we go back to the earliest Buddhist text, to the Pali Canon, we'll see that the Buddha often teaches that there are two types of good we have to take into account, two types of benefit, our own benefit and the benefit of others. For example, the Buddha teaches his own son, Rahula. He says, Rahula, before you act, before you speak, you should stop and reflect. You should ask yourself, will this action of mine lead to any harm to myself or any harm to others or any harm to both? If this is the case, you should avoid this action. But if you know when you reflect that this action will lead to my own true benefit, or to, to, or to the benefit of others, or to the benefit of both, then you should perform that action. Again and again the Buddha teaches, you should always reflect before acting, while acting, and even after acting. Reflect on one's own benefit and the benefit of others. These two ends both justify action both must be balanced and taken into account. And the same insistence on a balance of self-regarding and altruistic motives comes through in another statement of the Buddha. In one sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says that there are four types of people found in the world. There is the person who is concerned neither with his own good nor the good of others. This person, the Buddha says, is the worst one of them all. He is like a stick which on one side is burning and blazing with fire, on the other side it's smeared with filth. So you don't want to grab hold of the stick on either side. If you take hold of the left side, you'll get burnt. If you take hold of the right side, then you'll get dirty. That is like the man, the person who is not concerned either with his own good or with the good of others. Then there is the person who is concerned with the good of others but not with his own good. And third, the person who is concerned with his own good but not with the good of others. These two are in the middle. Then finally, there is the person who is concerned both with his own good and the good of others. This person, the Buddha says, this fourth one, this is the best, the highest, the chief, and the most excellent. This person, the Buddha says, is like purified cream of ghee. That is, to get cream of ghee, you begin with milk, then you turn the milk into butter, from butter you extract the ghee. When you purify the ghee further, then you get something called cream of ghee which is supposed to be very delicious, very expensive also. And this fourth person, the Buddha says, this person is like the cream of geese. 
But the Buddha also says that the concern for the welfare of others also has to be tempered by the recognition that we can only benefit others truly to the extent that we have benefited ourselves. In order to be able to help and assist others effectively, we first have to establish ourselves on firm ground. A man who stuck himself in the mud cannot help another get out of the mud. If he tries to do so, both will be stuck and both will sink down. In order to help somebody out of the mud, we have to be on firm ground ourselves. We have to be ourselves safe and secure. So therefore, to help and to benefit others in the true way, we have to seek our own true benefit as well by developing within ourselves the pure, high spiritual qualities which will enable us to benefit others. Now, the particular applications of Buddhist social thought have firm roots in the doctrines of Buddhism. And to understand these social applications, we should see the way they arise out of their foundation in the Buddhist doctrine itself. And the primary concept for understanding the social thought of Buddhism is the same concept which lies at the base of the entire Buddhist doctrine, that is, the concept of Dhamma. The word Dhamma, as we've explained, means that which upholds, that which sustains. In its broadest sense in Buddhism, it signifies the cosmic law which supports all phenomena, the law of dependent origination. Paticca Samuppada. It covers also the law of the Four Noble Truths, the three characteristics of existence, and all the other particular ramifications of Buddhist doctrine. The concept of Dharma also has an ethical dimension. In its ethical dimension, it is the law of righteousness, the principle of virtue, of moral truth. Dharma here is the moral law which protects us, which upholds us, which safeguards us against spiritual degeneration from the fall into lower states of existence and from the fall into samsara. It is the path of mundane spiritual development and the supramundane path which leads out of the round of birth and death. So the word Dhamma combines these two ideas, the philosophical idea and the ethical idea. It fuses them together into this one law of reality and virtue. Now this Dhamma, this one Dhamma, divides into many Dhammas, in accordance with the different spheres of human activity. Now, when after a heavy rain, when there are many pools of water on the ground, then the one moon, when we see it reflected in the water, we see that it gives rise to many images of itself. And so we see many images of the moon. In a similar way, when this one all-embracing Dhamma, the cosmic moral law, is seen applied to the various domains of human activity, it produces or gives rise to many Dhammas, many ideals of conduct appropriate to each particular situation. Thus, for example, there is the Dhamma of the monk, that is, the various ideal practices which the monk should undertake. There is the Dhamma for householders, the ideal way of conduct for a householder. The Dhamma for a father or for a mother, for a wife, for a husband, 
for members of the various social classes and so on. Each type of individual has its own dhamma. And to follow one's own particular dhamma is to live in harmony with the universal dhamma, the law of righteousness and truth. And it is out of this concept of universal dhamma that all the particular duties and obligations of each individual in all aspects of social life derive. As we go on, we shall see particular applications of this concept of Dharma to the different domains of human life and to the different types of human relationship. Another foundation for Buddhist social thought is the Four Noble Truths themselves, especially the Second Noble Truth, that craving and the other defilements are the origin of suffering. Usually, we understand the second truth to teach that craving is the cause of our personal suffering, of our worries, anxieties, fears, and sorrows, or else for our transmigration in samsara, in the round of birth and death. But in some suttas, the Buddha also explains that the same craving becomes the source of suffering and misery in our social existence. For example, in the 13th Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha says that because of the craving for sense pleasures, the craving for sensual enjoyment, the father fights against the son, the son fights against the father, the mother fights against the daughter, family fights with family, household with household, social group with social group, nation with nation. He says that because of the desire and attachment for pleasures and for wealth, men put on armor, they take up their swords, they prepare their weapons, they go into battle, and they fight each other and destroy each other and they kill each other. All of this, the Buddha says, comes about because of the craving for sense enjoyment. And unfortunately, it seems the modern world, to a large degree, bears ample testimony to this. Again, in the 15th Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha gives an interesting variation on the formula for dependent arising, the teacher Samupada. After he has explained dependent arising all the way down to craving, he then declares that in dependence on craving there arises search that is, searching for objects of craving. In dependence on search, there arises acquisition, that is, you acquire the objects of craving. Then, in dependence on acquisition, there comes discrimination. You form the notion, this is mine, not yours. That's yours, not mine. Then, because of discrimination, there comes attachment and desire. One becomes attached to one's own possessions and desires the possessions of others. Then, in dependence and desire, clinging, possessiveness, and selfishness arise. Because of selfishness, there comes the sense of protectiveness, the kind of paranoia that makes you feel you have to protect your own possessions from the encroachment of others. Then, the Buddha says, in dependence on this sense of protectiveness, Men take up their clubs, they take up their swords, they become involved in wrangling, quarrels, disputes, and false accusations in all sorts of unwholesome states. All of these the Buddha traces to their root in craving. And he says that if craving is eliminated, then all of these will be eliminated. Thus, all these social problems come from the basic cause of craving. The doctrine of egolessness, anatta, also implies certain principles of social ethics. Buddhism teaches that the idea of self is the root of suffering, since it lies at the base of all the selfish, emotions and defilements which cause suffering. 
Therefore, to get free from this trouble, from the social turmoil that comes from the defilements, we have to uproot the sense of selfhood. And we uproot the sense of selfhood by beginning to act in ways which contribute to diminishing the grip of the self-idea. Ultimately, the eradication of selfhood has to come about through wisdom, the wisdom that arises out of meditation. But meditation cannot be sealed off in a compartment of its own separate from the rest of our life. True wisdom doesn't arise while we are living outwardly in a selfish manner dominated by all sorts of selfish desires. To generate wisdom in meditation we have to begin in little ways in our outward life by cultivating pure and selfless actions of body and of speech, by giving, by observing precepts, by helping and assisting others, and so forth. Then all of these little acts will build up a momentum that will diminish the inner clinging to selfhood and provide the foundation for wisdom to arise the wisdom of selflessness that directly and intuitively realizes the absence of selfhood in all things. Still, another foundation for the social ethic of Buddhism lies in four high spiritual states to be developed in meditation. These states are called the Brahma Viharas, that is, the sublime states or the divine dwellings. The word Brahma means divine or supreme. The word Vihara, a dwelling place. The four sublime states, the four Brahma Viharas, are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. The first loving kindness, that is in Pali, metta. And this is the wish for the welfare and happiness of others. As an ethical attitude and a meditative state, it is to be developed to an immeasurable extent until it embraces all living beings, enfolding all living beings in infinite loving kindness, the wish for their welfare and happiness. The second Brahma Vihara is compassion. Whereas loving kindness is the wish for the welfare and happiness of others, compassion, a karuna, is the feeling of empathy with others. The quality that makes the heart tremble and shake with the suffering of others. This is the quality which makes us identify with others and feel their suffering as if it were our own. And when compassion works on us, then it arouses the desire to relieve and alleviate the suffering of others, to take away their, su their misery and the causes of their misery. And like metta, this quality of compassion, of karuna, is to be extended immeasurably to all beings. The third divine dwelling is sympathetic joy, mudita. Mudita is the quality of rejoicing in the happiness and good fortune of others. This quality tends to remove envy and jealousy and to arouse joy over the fortune of others. Then the fourth Brahma Vihara is equanimity. This is the attitude of impartial neutrality, the equality of mind that is extended towards all beings. Normally, we tend to favor those we like and to dislike those who threaten us or disturb us. But when we develop upeka equanimity, then we cultivate a mind which does not discriminate between the close and the distant, which looks with equal friendliness upon everyone, 
those who are agreeable to us and those who are hostile to us. So one with equanimity can look upon all beings without discrimination. These are four ethical attitudes to be developed first in meditation, but which can reach expression in concrete action in the social, economic, and political spheres. So far we've explained the foundations of Buddhist social thought. Now we'll discuss the applications of these principles to different areas of social concern. We'll take first the Buddha's teachings on economics. Now some modern schools of thought, like Marxism, regard the economic domain as the primary determinant of social existence and dismiss everything else beyond that as mere superstructure a secondary overlay on top of the material condition. Contrary to this view, the Buddha recognized that there are many interdependent spheres of human activity. These cannot be subjected to some, simplis to some simplistic reduction, but they have to be seen as mutually efficacious as interrelated. The Buddha took note of the importance of economics to human life, and he held that if people are to be capable of personal and spiritual progress, the economic foundation has to be secure. We have to be able to live a secure life materially and economically. In one sutta, the 26th Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha shows clearly how poverty can become a cause of social chaos and deterioration. He explains that in the distant past there were many virtuous kings who reigned over happy and prosperous kingdoms, and these kings provided for the welfare of their subjects by giving them all sorts of material and economic assistance. After several generations, one king arose in this lineage who neglected to take care of his subjects materially. He fulfilled all of his other royal duties, but he failed to give his people wealth when they were poor. As a result, poverty became widespread in the kingdom. Because of this poverty, people began to steal. Then the king, in order to counteract theft and robbery, he instituted punishment for those who stole. He decreed that they would be punished with execution. As a result of this, when people were approached by the royal police, they would lie in order to avoid being arrested, or else they would murder the policemen who came to bring them to court. Then, from this murder and lying, all sorts of social evils broke out until complete chaos ruled in the country. So here we see that in the Buddha's view, the economic order becomes a determinant of the social and moral order. In the story, the king's failure to provide for the welfare of his people led to social disorder. In extending the principle further, the sutta seems to imply that if the governing body, whatever its form, be it kingship or anything else, if it does not ensure that the people are economically well off, that they're secure, the result will be chaos and confusion, even crime in society at large. And so here the Buddha teaches not only that economics to a large extent determines man's moral condition, but also that the government has the responsibility to correct any kind of extreme economic injustice. In another discourse, the fifth sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha describes another kingdom where a similar situation erupted. This time the king, rather than instituting some measure on his own, came to his advisor, a Brahmin, to seek advice. 
This Brahman, of course, turns out to be the Bodhisattva, the one who is going to become our Buddha in some past life. So the king came to the Brahman and he said to him, Now there is pillaging and looting in my kingdom. To counteract this, I want to punish the thieves. Should I do this? The Brahman advisor told him, he said, If you try to improve the situation by instituting punishment, that will only deal with the surface symptoms that won't strike at the underlying root. If you want to get to the root of the problem, you have to look after the well-being of your subjects. There are people in your kingdom who are farmers, who raise cattle and grow crops. To them, you have to give feed for the cattle and grain for their crops. There are people in your kingdom who are merchants and businessmen. They don't have any money to run their business. That's why they're robbing. You have to give them capital to conduct their business. In your kingdom, there are people who used to work in the government service as civil uh, servants, but you're not giving them jobs. They're unemployed, so they have to steal. You should give feed and grain to the farmers, loans to the businessmen so they can carry on their trade, and give jobs to the government employees, the clerks, if you do this, then all these men will stop robbing and stealing. The royal revenue will go up. The country will be quiet and at peace. And then, the Buddha says, the people, pleased and happy, will live with open doors, dancing with children in their arms. From this, we can see that the Buddha gives very specific and practical advice on economic matters for improving the conditions of the country. Buddhism also tends to promote economic well-being in society by its stress on the virtue of generosity. The Buddha teaches all his disciples, whether they be monks or lay people, to practice giving, to be generous and bountiful towards others, living with open hands. The wealthy, in particular, in Buddha society, have the duty and obligation to give to the poor, to help and to assist the poor. The things that can be given, these the Buddhist texts classify very minutely. The main objects are the basic requisites of existence, clothing, food, dwelling places, and medicine. Secondary objects include seats, vehicles, lights, books, utensils, and so forth. All of these get classified very minutely. But the Buddha praises especially the giving of food. He says that if people knew the value or benefit of giving food, the rewards they would get for themselves by giving food, they would not sit down to eat even a single meal without giving something to eat to somebody else if there is an opportunity to do so. He says that one who gives food gives five things. He gives life, or long life. He gives beauty or good complexion. He says that one who gives food gives five things. He gives life his long life, he gives beauty or good complexion, he gives happiness, he gives strength, physical health, and he gives intelligence. Because the person who receives the food and who eats it, then he gets, his life gets extended, he acquires a good complexion, he feels happy and pleasure over receiving the food, he gains health, and his mind is able to function properly and to utilize its intelligence. And the Buddha says that one who gives food gives these five things, and in turn he receives these five things back. That is, the comic result of giving food is to obtain for oneself long life, if not in this lifetime, then in some other lifetime. You obtain yourself beauty happiness, health, and intelligence. All of this comes through giving. 
then on many occasions the Buddha has given practical bits of advice to lay people on how to deal with their economic affairs. One time a group of lay people came to the Buddha and said, Bhante, we aren't monks living in the forest. We don't know much about meditation or philosophy. but We need something that's practical, something that can help us right here and now, and also something that will help us advance in future lives. Teach us what is appropriate for us. Then the Buddha taught them four things that lead to happiness here and now. He said, first, the first thing that's required is energy and diligence. If you work at some job, some profession, trade or business, you have to be energetic and diligent in performing your work. The second factor is security. It is when you acquire wealth, you have to protect it carefully to make sure it remains safe. The third thing is good friendship. You have to associate with good friends, true friends, with virtuous people who will help you and protect you. Then fourthly, you have to maintain a balanced livelihood. You shouldn't be too bountiful, spending more than your means permit, and you shouldn't be niggardly, clinging to your wealth. But you should avoid these extremes and spend in proportion to your income. Those are the four things the Buddha taught leading to welfare here and now. Then he went on to teach four things that lead to long-term benefit in the future. That is faith or confidence and spiritual values, generosity, moral discipline, and wisdom. The Buddha also got down into the very practical matters of the right ways of acquiring wealth. The four standards of right livelihood to which the lay follower should conform. That is, he should acquire wealth only by legal means, not by illegal means. He should acquire it without violence. He should acquire it honestly. And he should acquire wealth in ways which do not harm others. Then, having acquired wealth in these ways, the Buddha went on to teach five uses that the lay person should make of his wealth. Firstly, he should use it to provide for his own household, his family, relatives, children, and so on. Secondly, he should use the wealth to make gifts to friends, to entertain them, to give them presents at the holiday season, and so on. Thirdly, he should use wealth to protect and repair his property and his dwelling. Fourth, he should pay taxes and make the oblations to the deities. And fifth, he should use wealth to offer alms and requisites to the monks and brahmins. This deals with the, some of the aspects of the Buddha's economic teaching. Now coming to the specific social teachings of the Buddha, the teachings that are designed for molding and transforming society. Now from the Buddhist viewpoint, society itself is an abstraction, not a reality. Society is a collective whole made up of individuals and the quality of society reflects the individuals who compose it. If the individuals are corrupt, the society will be corrupt. If the individuals are noble and pure, the society will be noble and pure. Since society merely reflects the individual, its individual members, the Buddha aimed at transforming society by giving individuals new standards of conduct, new ideals and patterns of, co of behavior which would elevate and transform their conduct. Then changes in the social order would follow as a matter of course. There are various codes of conduct taught by the Buddha which fulfill this requirement. These codes were designed originally for individual observance, 
But when put into practice, they bring about far-reaching changes in the social order. Some instances we might mention are the five precepts to abstain from killing, from stealing, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, and from intoxication. Though these lines of conduct help improve our individual conduct, but when they're observed by many people throughout the society, then they purify and elevate the society. Similar considerations apply to the ten courses of wholesome action, ten bases of merit, the Noble Eightfold Path, and so forth. Now, the unit of society upon which the Buddha places the greatest emphasis is the family. The Buddha regards the family as especially important because the family is the intermediary between the individual and society as a whole. It is in the family that the individual receives his basic training. It is here that he learns the ideals and standards that will govern his conduct for the rest of his life. And therefore, sound relationships have to be established between the members of the family in order for those who are raised in that family to become responsible members of society. The Buddha deals with family relations generally under two headings, the relation of husband and wife and the relation of parents and children. Regarding the first he holds that the husband and work wife have certain reciprocal duties which they should perform. These are given on the supplementary sheet for this lecture. The amongst it's one of the mutual duties of the different relations in society. So these can be obtained by consulting that sheet. They don't have to be mentioned here. The Buddha, however, it should be said, emphasizes that marriage is not only a means to economic security, to companionship, or to sensual gratification. While all of these might enter into the marriage relationship, they do not exhaust it. Ideally, the relationship of marriage should promote the moral and spiritual development of both husband and wife. And therefore, the husband and wife, while performing their respective duties to each other, they should be generous towards others. They should observe the precepts, avoiding wrong actions. They should support religious teachers, the monks, the sangha, and also they should cultivate their own spiritual practice. Then with regard to, with regard to the relation of parents and children, the Buddha emphasizes the reciprocal obligations of both. The parents have the duty to educate their children, to bring them up properly, to steer them away from wrong, to guide them towards what's right. These duties are set out on the sheet. The children also have duties to their parents, to respect their parents and to attend to their needs. And speaking to the monks, the Buddha stresses the filial obligations of the children. He says there are two people that you can never repay, your mother and your father. The reason is that your mother and father give birth to you, nourish you, bring you up, support you. They teach you, educate you, introduce you to the world. Therefore, you can never repay them even if you carry them on your, sh on your shoulders for the rest of their life. However, the Buddha says, there is a way to repay mother and father. That is, if they don't have faith in the Dhamma to establish them in faith, if they don't observe the precepts to teach them the precepts, if they're stingy and selfish to teach them to be generous, if they're deluded and lack wisdom, then you should give them teaching on how to develop their wisdom. In this way, the Buddha says, you can repay your parents and do more than repay your parents. In coming to society at large, we find that the Buddha set out the basic social relationships in terms of different classes of people. 
and he said that the members of these classes have certain duties or obligations to each other. For example, in society, we have friends, and so each person has a relationship or certain duties to his friends. We work at a job, and so we have duties to our boss if we're an employee. Or if we are an employer, then we have certain duties to our employees. The teacher has duties to his pupils. The pupils have duties to their teachers. The lay people have duties to the monks, to the sangha, and the monks have duties to the lay people. Now, this last group is something that I'll deal with a little bit at some length. That is the relation of monks and householders in a Buddhist society. The Buddhist monk, the bhikkhu, is not a priest who has some intermediary role between the laity and some higher spiritual being, a god or a deity. The monk is somebody who has left the household life in order to practice very diligently the teaching of the Buddha and to help sustain the teaching to keep it alive in the world. And the Buddhist community as a whole divides into these two sections, the Sangha and the laity, the monastic order and the householders. And the Buddha teaches that these two have to cooperate, to work hand in hand to preserve and to propagate the Dhamma, to make the truth, the liberating truth, available in the world. And the Buddha holds that each side in this pair has certain obligations towards the other. The laity, he teaches, should provide for the material needs of the Sangha. The monks do not work at some secular occupation, earning money and buying things that they need with their money, but they live in dependence on others for their material requisites. Parapati Padda Mejivikati. My livelihood is dependent on others. That's a reflection of the monk. So the livelihood of the monk is dependent upon the gifts and donations of others. And since the order requires the support of the laity, the lay people, the householders, are advised to provide for the material needs of the monks, to show them respect and to encourage them in their efforts to practice and teach the Dhamma. The monks, in turn, who acquire the knowledge and experience of Dhamma have their duty to the laity. On the basis of their knowledge and experience, they are advised to teach the lay people, to make the Dhamma known to them, to give them guidance and advice which will help them practice the Dhamma in their day-to-day -day life. And also the monks have the duty to give the lay people opportunities for more intensive practice as an undertaking, meditation, retreat, and so forth. The Buddha says that these two divisions of the Buddhist community, the monks and the laity, should help each other and assist each other so that in this way both will be able to cross the flood of samsara and reach the safe shore of Nibbana. Now we come to the political teachings of the Buddha. According to the traditional account, the Buddha was originally himself destined to be a king. He was the son of a king destined to become a king but he renounced his right to the throne in order to become a religious seeker. Historically, as a member of the class of the Kattiyas, the nobles, the aristocrats, before his renunciation, he must have gained extensive experience in government administration. And even though he became a religious teacher rather than a ruler, Still, he frequently came into contact with kings and with government officials of the various states in which he moved and taught. His disciples include a number of kings. King Bimbisara of Magadha, who is one of the most powerful kings of the time. King Pasenadi Kosala another powerful king, the king of the state of Kosala, King Ajatasattu of Magadha, 
these were disciples of the Buddha, King Udena and others. Also at the time of the Buddha, there were a number of republican states in northern India in which the Buddha taught. And the Buddha also gave advice and counsel to their leaders, especially the Lichavis, who lived in the area of Vesali. So the Buddha had disciples from both types of political rule, the republican and the monarchical. And the Buddha gave teachings impartially to their leaders, their representatives, and their citizens. However, the Buddha didn't advocate one type of government over another. He didn't prefer republican government to kingship, and he didn't prefer kingship to republican form. But rather, he taught that whatever the form of government might be, the guiding principle of the state should be the Dhamma, the law of righteousness. The sovereign body in the state does not have the right to use its power for its own advantage. And the reason it doesn't have this right is because it is subject to a higher law, a higher rule, a law independent of all arbitrary whims, desires, and fancies. That is, it is subject to the cosmic law, the ethical law of Dhamma. One time, this is in the Anguttara Nikaya, a monk comes to the Buddha and says, Bhante, the ruler, the king, the Chakavati Raja, the wheel-turning king, has great power. He is the sovereign of the land. But tell me, is there a ruler of the king? Does the king have another king above him? And the Buddha says, Monk, yes, the king also has his ruler. The king has another king above him. And what is the ruler of the king? The ruler of the king is the Dhamma. The king, the Buddha says, should respect, revere, and venerate the Dhamma. He should take the Dhamma as a standard the Dhamma as his criterion, and he should rule his kingdom in subordination to the Dhamma. And thus the Dhamma, this moral, spiritual principle of righteousness, this becomes the governing standard of all the particular forms of government, the standard against which we can measure all the particular laws passed by a state, all the lines of conduct undertaken by a ruler, by the ruler. And to rule in accordance with the Dhamma, the government must provide for the material welfare of its citizens, and they must also establish conditions which will promote their moral and spiritual development. The Buddha does not stop with mere generalities. He goes on to lay down specific ways for the king or the ruling power to substantiate the Dhamma in its administration. One formula he gives on the negative side is the avoidance of the four evil motives. In the text themselves, these are given for the king, but they can be applied to any ruling official. The four evil motives that are to be avoided are firstly partiality or favoritism, showing attachment to certain people or ideas. The second is anger or hatred, that is intense aversion towards people or towards other things. The third evil motive is delusion, to be confused, stupid, and dull-minded. And the fourth evil motive is fear, to act out of fear and timidity. On the positive side, Buddhism teaches that the government, especially the king, should observe ten standards, which are called the ten royal virtues, the Dasa Raja Dhamma, 
These are often referred to in the Jataka tales, the stories of the Buddha's past life. First of all, the king should be generous, should be ready to distribute the wealth of the kingdom to the people, to make sure that everybody is able to acquire the basic necessities of life, that nobody has to be hungry or be deprived of the dwelling place, clothing, and so on. Secondly, the king or the rulers should be well disciplined in his conduct. He should observe the five precepts, not to kill, steal, commit adultery, lie, or drink intoxicants. Third is the virtue of self-sacrifice. The ruler should be ready to sacrifice himself for the good of the kingdom ready to give up everything for the benefit of his subjects, even his own life. And the Jataka stories give us an interesting illustration of this virtue. In one story, we meet a monkey king. This is the Bodhisattva, the future Buddha. This monkey king has to look after the welfare of his troop of monkeys, take care of them and rule them. And once, when they were in danger, they have to flee through the forest. And they have to pass over a number of trees. But they reach a certain point where there's a gap or a gulf between one tree and another. And so the monkey king lays down on one tree. He grasps the tree with his feet. Then he leans over and he grasps the tree on the other side with his arm, with his hand. And he makes a bridge out of his body so that all the monkeys could cross over to safety. But as a result of this brave act on his part, his back gets broken. And at the time that this is happening, there is a human king down below passing through the forest. And he watches this event. He witnesses the great, noble, courageous act of the monkey king. And when he sees that the monkey king has been ready to give up his life for the safety of his fellow monkeys, when the monkey king falls out of the trees, falls down to the ground, the human king comes over to him and asks him why he did this. And then this monkey king, with all of the grace that will become to manifestation in his later achievement of Buddhahood, the monkey king teaches the human king that it is the duty of a ruler to be ready to sacrifice even his own life for the welfare of his subjects. And thus, a human king learns the proper duty of a ruler from a monkey king. The fourth royal virtue is justice. The king should administer his realm with justice with equality towards others, not with favoritism and partiality. The fifth virtue is gentleness. The king should be gentle, loving, and kind to all the people. Sixth is austerity. The king should be austere in his own way of life. He shouldn't be addicted to luxurious enjoyments, to comforts and conveniences, but he should try to live very simply, contented with the basic necessities. Seventh, he should be free from enmity, from hatred and ill will. Eighth, he should rule with non-violence. He shouldn't be fond of conquering by war and by violence, and he shouldn't be disposed to inflict violent punishment on others. The ninth, Virtue is patience, not getting angry and upset, remaining persistent despite difficulty. And the tenth virtue is non-opposition. That is, the king should not oppose the will of the people, but he should always follow their will when it accords with what is right. Those are the ten royal duties of the ruler. The Buddha also gives in the suttas, he mentions four, what are called the four bases of popularity 
These are already contained, in the, at least implicitly, in the Ten Royal Duties, but we'll just mention them for the sake of completeness. The four bases of popularity are generosity, kind speech, benevolent conduct, and impartial treatment of others. Beyond these, the, ten- the text, the Buddhist text, also mentions some uncodified obligations of the king or government that the ruler should implement in his rule. The government has the duty, firstly, to protect all the inhabitants in the land. And the texts say not only the human beings, but the animals as well. This is very significant that the Buddha teaches that the righteous king protects not only people in all the different social classes, but he also has the obligation to protect the birds and beasts, the animals of the land. And accordance with, in accordance with this precept, we find that in Buddhist countries such as Sri Lanka and ancient India, perhaps Burma and Thailand also, The great Buddhist kings of the past have built animal hospitals and have had doctors trained to take care of the animals. The government or the king also has the noble duty to inspire the people in virtue. The king is compared to the leader of a herd of cattle. The people are like the cattle who follow the leader. If the chief bull in the herd takes a wrong course, then the other cows will take a wrong course. If the chief bull goes the right way, the other cows will go the right way. And thus the king or the rulers, the king or the ruler has to be himself a model of righteousness and virtue and thereby inspire the people to follow his example. The king also has the duty to provide wealth to the poor, to make sure that everybody is economically secure. And also the king should learn from the wise, from monks, recluses, brahmins, and sages. He should not be proud and arrogant because of his high position, but he should turn to sages for advice and guidance, especially to those monks who are distinguished by their learning, by their piety and wisdom. Thus, we see that during the golden age of Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia, the great Buddhist kings have always had a distinguished Mahatera, a senior member of the monastic order, as his special advisor to give him advice on, and counsel on moral and religious matters. The last issue of the Buddha's political teaching that we will deal with is his approach to the problem of war. The Buddha teaches clearly and explicitly that to rule in accordance with Dhamma The ruler, the government or king, has to avoid aggressiveness and attempts to conquer by violence. The Buddha himself once prevented a war between two states in the India of his time, the Koliyas and the Sakyas. These two lands were divided by a river, the river Rohini, and both wanted to divert the river for their own use. Because of this conflict over the use of the river, the two sides became hostile to one another and they were prepared to go into battle to fight to take possession of the river. The armies were lined up on opposite sides of the river. And the Buddha learned about this. And both of these people were his own kinsmen. He himself was a Sakya, born in the Sakya land, His mother was a Kolia. And so the Buddha himself was related to people of both sides. When the Buddha learned about the impending conflict, he came onto the scene. He called the leaders into his presence and then he asked them. He said, tell me, what is the value of the water in this river? Is it of very great value? Both said, no, the water is really of very little value. Then the Buddha said, tell me, what is the value of human blood? They said, oh, the value of human blood is very great. Human blood is precious and priceless, is precious and priceless. Then the Buddha asked, he said, tell me now, 
both of you, are you ready to shed all of this human blood to slaughter each other just for the sake of the water and this river? Is this a sensible thing to do? When they were asked this, they said, no, this is absolutely senseless. Thus they both gave up their weapons, they became friends, and they lived together in peace, sharing the use of the water and the river between them. Time and again the Buddha teaches in one way or another that violence must be avoided, that peace can never be established by force and conquest. The Buddha says that when one side conquers another, the conqueror only breeds resentment in the one who is defeated, while he himself has to live in constant anxiety, worrying that he will be defeated in turn. Neither side really wins the battle. The conqueror also loses, since he can never find happiness, never be free from worry and anxiety through his victory. Peace, the Buddha says, can only be found by stepping outside the vicious circle of conquest and violence. The real conqueror for for the Buddha is not the man who conquers other men, other nations, and other societies, but the man who conquers himself. The Buddha said that if there is a warrior who conquers in battle a thousand men a thousand times, his conquest is very slight compared with the conquest of a man who conquers one man, namely himself. The man who conquers himself his desires, cravings, anger, and delusions, he is the supreme victor in battle. And the Buddha teaches that there are four kinds of conquest that his followers should make. That is, they should conquer the evil person by means of goodness. They should conquer the liar by truth. They should conquer the stingy by giving generously. And they should conquer the hostile man by love and by goodness. For it is only by love, the Buddha teaches, never by hatred and violence, that hatred can be brought to see. It is only by peace, by patience, by kindness and compassion, that the cycle of violence and revenge can be brought to a stop.